we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have touched. Today we're studying the book of Ezra. This is the book of rebuilding or the book of restoration. And we're going to be talking about something that was totally ruined, it seemed, at least from a human perspective, and how it was restored wonderfully. Ezra is the story of the restoration of a nation and the restoration of the temple. Now, God is so involved in all of this. You're going to be amazed as we look through the book of Ezra and see his hand at every turn. Things that have been prophesied years before they happen. I want you to begin by opening your book to Ezra 1. But I want to tell you a couple of things. Uh, First of all, Ezra is the story of the captives, you remember. They've been uh, held in captivity in Babylon for all this time, 70 years, and now they've been released and are coming home to take care of restoring Jerusalem. Ezra really doesn't appear on the scene, though, until the seventh chapter, but he's writing the entire book. Now, Ezra is a scribe, and you heard about him in the book of Second Chronicles because he wrote that book. And you're going to hear more about him as he does appear. But we have some main characters. We have Zerubbabel, who is really the leader. He's the governor of the first return. Now, let me just tell you very quickly, there are three returns from Babylon, or now Persia, but from captivity. The first two returns take place in the book of Ezra, and then there'll be a third return, but that's in the book of Nehemiah. Now, uh, we're going to see that Zerubbabel is the leader, and he's sort of like the governor. And then we have Joshua, who's the priest. It's spelled J-E-S-H-U-A, so it's a little confusing, but it's pronounced Joshua. Then we have two prophets who have books of their own. Their names are Haggai and Zechariah. And then Ezra, of course, appears on the scene. And then we have a number of Persian kings, beginning with King Cyrus. And so we'll be looking into what goes on at what time with each of these individuals and the part they play in the book of Ezra. Now, after 70 years of captivity, the people return, not all of them, a remnant, return to Jerusalem and they return to rebuild. And that's what the whole book is about, to restore. It takes place between 536 and 445 BC and it covers a period of 91 years. But 58 of those years, we know nothing about in this book because those years take place in the book of Esther. So when we come to the end of chapter 6 and we pick up with chapter 7, there are 58 years between those two books that we don't realize right here. But you know that now. Now, it takes place in Persia and in Jerusalem, mostly in Jerusalem, but each section begins uh, the first one being about the first return and the second part being about the second return, they start in Persia. But then the remnant travels to Jerusalem and that's where the main part of the book takes place. Now, Ezra records the history of this returned remnant and the restoration that takes place in Jerusalem, first of the temple and then of the nation. But another thing that you don't want to miss is God's faithfulness. God keeps his promises years before, years before Cyrus was born or before the people were, were released from captivity. It was written down that they would be released. And you know, we can take God at his word. 
What he says he'll do, he'll do. And so Ezra is really a very encouraging book. Now, the book of Ezra gives us a picture of God's grace, and it shows us that no matter what we do or how far we go from God, that when we confess our sin and we come back, he is always there, ready and willing to forgive us. And that's what happens here. And that same grace available to the nation of Israel who had certainly sinned and fallen away from God is available for you and for me today. What an incredible thing to realize and to know. Now the first part that we're looking at is the, is the first return. This is the remnant re rebuilds and it's chapter 1 through 6. You have your Bible open, but before we get to the actual scripture, I want to just review for just a minute and give you a little bit of background. You remember that Israel was divided into two parts. It became the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was made up of the ten tribes, and the southern kingdom was made up of two tribes, and that was Judah and Benjamin. And idol worship became very prevalent, especially in the northern kingdom. And God warned them and warned them and warned them time and again through the prophets, but they didn't heed the warning. And so finally judgment came. And the northern kingdom, if you remember, was taken away and basically scattered by the nation of Assyria. Well, you'd think that the southern kingdom would have learned from that, but instead they continued in their practices. They had some good kings, but mostly bad kings, and they continued to go the way that the northern kingdom had gone. And so after a period of time, and after the prophets had warned them over and over again, then God pronounced judgment on them, and the nation of Babylon came in and captured them and took them to Babylon. But what you might not realize is that not too long after that, after they had been captured, then we have the nation of Babylon capturing Assyria. So Babylon becomes a huge power and takes over Assyria. And any of the people that were scattered throughout the land of Assyria are now basically scattered throughout Babylon and are assimilated there. But then not too long after that, the powerful nation of Persia rises up and conquers Babylon. So now the captives who were in Babylon are now in Persia. The land has become Persia. Now, what we need to see here is that Persia was a mighty, mighty kingdom. Persia covered over two plus million square miles, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. And we find that, uh, that there was a king that God raised up and touched his heart and his name was Cyrus. And we find him in the very first verse of chapter 1. And it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, this is his first year to reign, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. You see, this has been prophesied in Jeremiah years before. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom, and he also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judea. And then he says, whoever there is among all of his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judea, and be rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And so God touched his heart and stirred up in him a desire to let these captives go back to their homeland if they chose to do this. Now, one thing you need to understand is they're not in refugee camps and they're not in prison. They're not living a hard life. In fact, a lot of them are living a pretty comfortable life. And so God acted here through Cyrus. And these people are given some choices. They are given two choices, actually. They're told that they can return or they can support the return. And so we find that in chapter 1. The Holy Spirit stirs up some to go and some to give to make it possible for the others to go. Now, many of them didn't want to go because, like I said, their life is just doing fine. They're happy with it. And many of them were born in captivity and don't know the first thing about Israel other than what they've been told. They know if they go back, it'll be a life of hardship and it's a place that's desolate and the trip is going to be really difficult. You know, when God calls us to do things sometimes, it's not easy. It's sacrificial, isn't it? And so he stirred up in the heart of 50,000 people 
to go. But now, in light of how many there were, several million, that's not a very large number. But 50,000 said they would go and they would make this trip. Now, it's about a 530-mile journey if you go by the way the crow flies, but they couldn't go that way because of the desert and the conditions, so they had to go way up north over the caravan route, and it really doubled the distance. It was about a 900-mile trip. Now, imagine that with all of your family and your animals and everything that you're taking through the desert on foot. What an incredible journey. It's about four months minimum. Now, we find that a census was taken. We see this happening a lot in the Bible. And a census was taken to number the, the remnant and the journey began off they went. And that's all found in chapter 2. Now in chapter 3, the rebuilding begins and they are united, we're told, with one heart and one purpose. That's the way it should be in our churches, shouldn't it be? We should all be of the one mind and one purpose, serving God and doing His will. Well, Zerubbabel is God's choice to lead. Zerubbabel leads the remnant home. Now, he is a, a natural born leader, it seems, and he is in the line of royalty, really. And so we consider him the governor here. And uh, the people, the first thing they did was to build an altar, but they prayed and they did it because they were motivated out of fear. You know, the people who were in the land, the Gentiles and the heathens that still were there, here and there, they weren't just thrilled that the Israelites were showing up because they were messing up their party. They had life just the way they wanted it. Now these Israelites show up and there are a bunch of them and they're just not real happy. So they probably didn't send the welcome wagon over to see them. And so we find these uh, guys probably looking pretty threatening. And so the first thing that happens is they build an altar and they pray. You know, that's what you and I need to be doing when we're fearful of something. Instead of stopping or running or saying, oh, God must not be in this, like we say, we should pray. And that's exactly what they did. So they did that, and they did that just the way they should have. And God blessed them by protecting them, and the foundation was laid. And we find that in chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. But the people had a real mixture of emotions. It's interesting how this happened. Some of them were overjoyed. They were so excited because they had really accomplished something. So they were joyful and just rejoicing. And others were weeping because they had been there before and they had seen that temple the way it once was in its beauty and in its glory. And this temple was very simple in comparison. Didn't look the same. So it was hard for them. Now we see that the restoration then is hindered by opposition. Now, the opposition uses three tactics here, and we need to see what those are. The first tactic that's used is compromise. The second tactic that is employed is discouragement. And the third tactic that is used is accusation. Now I want to explain that for you just a little bit. But first I want to tell you that the way the enemy works is that if one thing doesn't work, don't think he gives up. Don't think he goes home. He just comes back at another opportune time. He even said that to Jesus. I'll just come back at another opportune time. Well, what happens in the compromise is they show up and um, they pretend to be friends. This is the enemy, the Gentiles or the heathens as they're known in Scripture. And they come where they're building. And they say, we've been worshiping God here. Let us help you rebuild. But thankfully, Joshua and Zerubbabel used discernment and they knew better. They recognized the truth from a lie. See, we need to be so well acquainted with the truth that the lie just jumps out at us. And so they knew this was not true and they needed help, but they didn't need help from the enemy. And you know, the Bible is just full of teaching about being unequally yoked. In the New Testament, those exact words are used. But in the Old Testament, throughout, God says over and over again, remove yourself from these people. Do not mix up with them because they mean you harm. And what they do and how they worship is going to rub off on you. So you don't need to do that. And so thankfully, they said thanks, but no thanks. We don't need your help. You just go on. Well, that probably didn't make them very happy, but they left. So then they decided the next tactic would be discouragement. Now, the interesting thing here is that they hired discouragers. They went out and hired people to frighten them and to frustrate them. 
I find that really interesting, too, because I think that here people volunteer to be discouragers. <laughs> I don't think you'd have to pay them anything because they just do it naturally. If there's anything that puts down God's work, it is someone who is discouraging you. So that didn't stop the work. But you know what the third tactic did? They said, we're going to write a letter. We're going to write a letter to the king of Persia. We're going to tell him what real ragtag people you are. We're going to tell him how you've rebelled and all the things you've done in the past. He obviously doesn't know this or he would not let you be rebuilding. So we're sending a letter home. We just want you to know that. And so when they heard that, the work stopped and it stopped for years. Here they were just doing things right, praying God was protecting, the foundation's been laid, everything's going along, but they listened to the opposition and they stopped. Makes me wonder how many times the enemy's tactics make us stop what we're doing. Doesn't it you? When we really should keep going. There is a real truth in this and that is that orders from God are often opportunities for the opposition. You can count on it. Orders from God are often opportunities for the opposition. Now, the remnant, though, is rallied because the thing that kicks out the, the discouragers is the encouragers. And if there's anything this world needs today, it's encouragement. And the encouragers show up. And if you'll look with me in chapter 5, we're going to find who they are. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says the prophets, Haggai and, the, and uh, Zechariah, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel who was over them. Now here they came to say, you guys, get up and get moving. What do you mean sitting here? And I'm not going to tell you a lot that they say because they have their own books that we'll be studying later on. But I will tell you what Haggai said because he looked around and he said, what is going on here? You people are decorating your own houses. I mean, you're putting up paneled walls. You're accessorizing. You're doing all kinds of things at your house while the house of the Lord lies in ruin. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with this picture? And he really got them moving again. And so these two guys, when they came on the scene, they fixed it so that the work started again. But you know the opposition didn't go away. It never does. They came back again and said, what do you mean starting this work again? Didn't you hear us? We sent a letter about you people. And you know the letter that they reported about them being rabble rousers and all that? It was true. Everything that had been said was true. So we need to keep ourselves above reproach so they don't have anything to say about us. But nevertheless, at this point, they had wised up a little bit. And so they send word back and say, that's fine. You go ahead and report to the new king. That'll be fine. But until he looks through the archives and finds the letter that King Cyrus wrote years ago, we're just going to keep right on working. Because there's a letter that contradicts what you're saying. We're supposed to be doing this. And they thought, aha, well, that's just what we'll do. So they sent a letter, but the work continued, which is a wonderful thing. They did not stop this time. And we find that uh, all through chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, a wonderful thing happens. Cyrus, the, the scroll that Cyrus had written was found in the archives. And it gave permission for this restoration to begin. So there was proof positive that they were doing exactly what they were supposed to do. Well, now the king is King Darius II. And King Darius sort of messed up the enemy's plans. He read that proclamation from King Cyrus and he said, you leave them alone. You guys back off and leave them alone. And furthermore, give them anything you, that they want. Supply them any supply they need, whether it's for building or for their sacrifices, whatever it might be. You give it to them and you pay it out of your tax money. You pay it out of the royal treasuries in your seats of government. And so this plan really backfired. They, and they were also told that if they interfered with the work, there would be incredible consequences. That could only be the hand of God that changed the heart of a king who didn't know any of this previously. He just um, went right along with what Cyrus had said. So he made this incredible decree. And you can find this in chapter 6, verse 7 through 12. And we won't take time to read it. But I do want you to see in, in verse 7, it says, Leave this work on the house of God alone. He 
He's talking to these enemies. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. And then he send, goes on and talks about, and uh, verse 8, paying it out of the treasury. And then if you go over uh, to verse 11, it says that any man who violates this edict, a timber shall be drawn from his house and he shall be impaled on it. And his house shall be made a refuse heap on account of this. So it was a death sentence if they got involved again and they backed off. When God is for us, who can be against us? The temple was rebuilt. Something that seemed totally impossible happened because God did it. Now we come to our second division, and this is the second return. The remnant is revived. Now Ezra that we heard about, who's the author of this book, Ezra is still living in Persia, and Ezra is stirred up to go home because they have the temple, but the people are in a mess. And you know, what good is the church if the people are spiritually uh, dead? And that's what was going on. And so he wanted to go home. And I just love him because if you'll look in chapter 7, it talks about Ezra just a little bit. But look uh, in chapter 7, verse 9, and it says down at the very last part of that verse, he came to Jerusalem because the good hand of his God was upon him. Go up to verse 6. I meant to read that first. It says the king granted him all that he requested because the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. What a wonderful thing if people could see that in our lives. If people responded to us because it was very obvious that the hand of God was on our life. He was a wonderful man. And then I want you to look uh, to see something very special about Ezra. Verse 10, Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances to Israel. He was a lover of the word of God. And he was a teacher of it. And he wanted others to know what it said. And so Ezra again uh, raises up some people, a remnant, to go back. This time, fewer people though. This time we have about 1,500 people and not a Levite in sight. They had to draft a Levite to get one to go back with them. And the trip was financed and Ezra was given authority. Anything he asked for on his travel, he was supposed to get it. And then we find that they are taking off. They count the people again. There's a census and they take off and they're just about to cross the river to really start the journey. And there's a little bit of fear. You know how sometimes you start something and then you think, oh my goodness, this is just taking my breath away. This is a little bigger than I thought. That's sort of what happened. And they thought maybe we should have asked for an escort. You know, this is a dangerous trip. But Ezra said something really profound. He said, how? How can we ask for an escort when we've just said that God is with us and going to take us? How can then we go back and say, we need help? We're not going to do that. We're going to fast and we're going to pray right here and we're going to trust God to take us. Gosh, I wish I were like that in every single thing and every step that I take. What a wonderful thing that would be if I could always trust God. Now, um, they took off on this trip. God did protect them. It took four months. They arrived. Offerings were made. Decrees were sent throughout the land. And no one bothered them because they knew that the king meant business. But there's a sad thing because we find that there's recognition of sin by Ezra. And we find this in chapter 9. And it's a terrible thing to see because... What happens here is that reports of unfaithfulness reach Ezra. The people have intermarried with the heathens. You know, we talked earlier about God saying, be, don't be uh, unequally yoked. But they had, during this 58-year period of time, just gotten away from God's command and done what they pleased. And so many of them had married foreign wives who brought in their foreign gods, and they had had, they had, had children in these marriages. And so Ezra was stricken. In fact, he is so upset that he mourns over this because this is rebellion. This rebellion grieves Ezra. And he, he fasts and he pulls out the hair in his beard and his head and he, he just lays before the Lord. He's so upset. Well, this gets the people's attention. It sort of shocks them. You know, when you're confronted by your sin, it's a pretty awful thing. 
You maybe have been able to ignore it, but now you can't. And so that's what happens here. The fearful people are summoned to come before Ezra. And then Ezra cries out before the Lord and confesses the sin, the sin of the nation. But he doesn't say these horrible people while I've been gone. Look what they've done. He says, Lord, we have sinned before you. He makes himself a part of it and he prays very specifically. That's something that you and I need to learn to do instead of just saying, Lord, forgive me for my sin because we wouldn't know if he did because we just we have so much of it. We need to name it. We need to say each thing we've done. He's very specific in this prayer. You can find it in chapter nine, six through 15. And it's considered one of the greatest prayers of confession in all of the Bible. He admits the past sin. He acknowledged is God's undeserved favor and grace and deliverance. And he admits that they need punishment. Yes, he says we do. We deserve it. And then he speaks of the righteousness of God. And you know, a revival happens after that because the covenant is renewed. We find this in Ezra 10 and there is restoration of Israel's relationship to God. It begins with their confessing, with their weeping, with the nation in mourning, with an assembly being called. They're given three days to arrive or they're going to be disinherited. They come and they have to be in the rain to hear the word of God because they have a broken relationship with God. Yes, they have a restored temple, but that's not doing a lot of good because there's sin in the nation, sin in their hearts, and they've gotten away from God. But you know, repentance, which means a complete change. You're going in one direction, which is away from God. You stop and you turn around, you go the other direction toward God. That repentance brings revival. You know, when there's a broken relationship in your life, nothing's right whether it's between God or between, between you and God or between you and someone else. Now, restoration's requirement is repentance. We have to repent. We have to turn from doing wrong and go back the way we should go toward God, the right way. And then the result of that is definitely revival. I wonder... If you might have a broken relationship today with someone, maybe it's God, maybe it's another person, but God would be the one who could fix that if we just ask him to.